In Florence, Italy, there's a museum that contains some of Michelangelo's less famous sculptures. Uh, Michelangelo is famous for his sculpture of David, uh, for his uh, Garden of Eden scene at the top of the Sistine Chapel. These are less famous uh, sculptures, uh, but they are uncompleted. Uh, there's a, a part of a torso here, a hand sticking out there, a, a leg protruding, partial head. It's almost as these, uh, like these sculptures are trying to break free from the marble and become who they were intended to be. Uh, but they're captives. Michelangelo called his unfinished sculptures captives. Uh, Jesus' first public sermon, he says, I have come to set captives free. Uh, we think of that usually as he's coming to set us free from our sins. But salvation is so much more than that. Uh, Jesus comes to help us uh, break free and become who we were intended to be, men and women. Unfortunately, a lot of men feel like half men. Uh, captives, incomplete. Uh, boys mostly walking around in men's bodies with men's responsibilities, finances, families. Many boys were never taken through the process of masculine initiation. That's why many of us are unfinished men. Uh, many men are not doing well today. Uh, practically all mass shootings are done by men. Uh, the average American man will die five years younger than women. Uh, the reason? Addiction and suicide. 73% of overdose deaths are men. 77% of suicides are men. 90% of prison inmates are men. Men are falling behind in education. Uh, more girls graduate from high school than boys. 62% of associate degrees go to women. 57% of bachelors go to women. 60% of master's degrees go to women. And 52% of doctorates. Uh, for every 100 black men who graduate from college, 230 black women graduate. So what's going on with men in our culture? Almost all studies trace the decline of men to the disappearance of fathers. The number of children living uh, in families with both fathers and mothers has decreased tw by 20% between 1960 and 2016. The percentage of children living just with their moms has tripled. The main cause of the disappearance of fathers is the breakup of marriages. Studies show that when men and women live together and have children together, but they're not married, 40% of those men never see their children after the children are two years old. Here's the good news. Jesus came to set captives free. He set an example of true manhood. He sets the standard. Uh, using a 1990s term, Jesus was the man. I want to look at the example of manhood Jesus set, but first I want us to start with the first Adam in Genesis chapter 3. If you want to follow along what I'm talking about today using the Bibles under the seats, uh, it's going to be uh, Genesis 3. It's on page 3. You know what? You can find this verse. Adam and Eve are in the garden of Eden. Uh, they have it good. They have, uh, uh, they're enjoying the beauty of God's creation like we're enjoying today, the great weather. Uh, they are enjoying a relationship with God. And I'm not sure how else to say this, but they run around naked all the time. And there's no shame. Then the serpent enters stage left. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. 
Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Adam makes three mistakes, sitting, hiding, and blaming. And nothing has changed. <laughs> Guys still make the same mistakes today. So let me make three challenges. Quit sitting, quit hiding, and quit blaming. First, quit sitting. We tend to focus on the fact that Eve ate the fruit first, and we let Adam off the hook. But notice where Adam is when Eve took and ate the fruit. He wasn't off on a business trip. He wasn't working another part of the garden. He was right there with her. And he does nothing. He doesn't try to stop his wife from taking a bite. So what's Adam doing? How can he just sit there and let his wife be tempted by Satan? Adam goes limp. Come on, Adam, do something. Look at Jesus by contrast. Few things are more impressive than the way Jesus treated women. In John chapter 8, religious leaders brought before Jesus a woman caught in the act of adultery. They said, according to Moses, the law, she should be stoned to death. What do you say? It was a trap. If he said, yeah, stone her, he would be seen as cruel and uncaring. But if he said, no, no, don't do that, then he'd be seen as soft on the law and disagreeing with Moses. So Jesus gets down on the ground and he draws in the sand for a little bit and then he stands up and he says, let the one among you who has not sinned throw the first stone. And the religious leaders all trickled off. Jesus comes to her defense Adam doesn't do a thing when the serpent is tempting his wife, but Jesus defends this woman. He didn't sit idly by. Men are naturally aggressive. It's part of our natural makeup. Um, just look at the N NFL and the NBA. I mean, it's unbelievable. Male aggression can have negative side effects. 90% of major crimes are committed by men. I think Jesus gives us a way to channel our aggression for positive good. But something has happened. I think many men feel like they have to check their, uh, their masculinity when they, when they come in the door of a church. We force them to find their adventure outside the church. You know, I want to thank all you men. Some of, some of these cars out here are, are brought by women, but most are by men. Thank you for bringing them today. I tell you, there's some great cars out there. Uh, before he was president, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, was a Sunday school teacher. And he, uh, um, uh, a, a boy came into his Sunday school class one day and he had a black eye. And what happened? Well, it turned out a bully was picking on his little sister, pinching her, and so he took a swing at him. And Teddy says, good job, man. And he gave him a dollar. Well, when word got out in the church what Teddy had done, he was relieved of his teaching responsibilities. I mean, I think we need more Teddy Roosevelt's in the church. Jesus was a man's man, too. Jesus clears out the money changers. Uh, money, uh, religious leaders had turned the temple into a, like a bazaar, and uh, uh, people would come and to make sacrifices and... Uh, and they had uh, lambs to sell them or turtle doves that they could purchase. And some people bring their own. and say, oh, I got my own lamb. And they said, no, nah, that one's no good. That one's damaged. You need to buy one of ours. And they would charge exorbitant prices. And they said, oh, yeah, in order to buy these, you have to use the temple money. So people have to go exchange their money. And again, they get ripped off there. And Jesus was just disgusted. And so he turns over all the money changers' tables. You could just feel his channeled aggression. Most of us today are unaware of the bravado of our spiritual ancestors, 
Our freedoms are the byproducts of their sacrifices, but their examples are often under, overlooked or underappreciated. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna in the second century. He was discipled by none other than the Apostle Paul, our Apostle John, one of Jesus' disciples. And uh, at 86 years age, he was arrested, and the proconsul said, if you curse Christ, I'll let you go. And he looked at him and he said, why would I do that? He's taken care of me for 86 years, never let me down. And so uh, the, the proconsul ordered him to be burned at the stake. And as they brought him in to be burned, an ear witness overheard a voice saying, be strong, Polycarp, Polycarp, play the man. And that's exactly what he did. They burned him at the stake, but he didn't, he didn't burn up. It's like, it's like the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you remember them? They were burned, but they, and they put in the furnace, but they didn't burn. And so to put him to death, uh, the executioner had to stab him. Guys, if you think church isn't for you, you haven't read about Jesus and the likes of Polycarp. God calls us as men to step up and to step up as fathers. God wants us to quit sitting and take up world-changing issues. When I challenge men to quit sitting, I'm talking to myself. Do you know I find it easier to lead Portland Community Church than to lead my own family? Every week I make stupid mistakes at home with my wife or my kids. I face situations where I don't know exactly what to do, and when I don't know what to do, I know, how, I know myself, I tend to withdraw, because I don't really don't know what steps to take. But God calls us to step up as men. Quit sitting. Second, quit hiding. Verse seven, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God who was walking in the garden, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Adam hid. Instead of confronting issues, men tend to hide. We hide behind fig leaves. We hide behind trees. Studies show that men are prone to hide their feelings. Women talk about their feelings much more easily than we do. We try to act like things are fine, everything's great, so we hide. Every man I know uh, uh, struggles with sexual temptation. I don't think I know any men who don't. I'm never surprised when uh, a man confesses sexual uh, struggle with me. It doesn't make my opinion of that man go down. Rather, it goes up. There is nothing harder for a man to do than to confess his weakness. When we do, it makes us more manly than hiding. One of the shining lights of the Jewish uh, history was King David. He was known as a man after God's own heart. Uh, but I'm sure to many of his family members, he was not seen as a shining example as a, as a dad. Uh, in 2 Samuel 12 to 18, we read about Absalom, one of his sons, who uh, had extraordinary potential, but it was hijacked by uh, the sexual assault on his sister by Amnon, his half-brother. He waited to see what David would do about it, but to his surprise, David didn't do anything. And so he took matters into his own hand and killed his brother. Then he fled because he knew his father would be enraged and would come after him. Amnon was the heir to the throne. But to his amazement, in this situation, David didn't do anything either. He just hid. And so Absalom was growing in rage toward his father, and he led a full-scale rebellion against the throne to take over, which ended up in Absalom's death. David hid. Raising children requires consistent discipline that consists of four parts, setting clear standards, taking quick and consistent action when the standards are violated, uh, uh, giving verbal reproof, tell your kid you know, wh wh what they did wrong, and then assuring them of your love. 
Say, even though I'm punishing you, I want you to know I love you. I do it in love. Of these four, I think the greatest mistake men make is failure to take action. It's action that changes behavior. Suppose police officers have no car, no siren, no radar, no gun, no stick, no black book. They can't enforce any laws. All they have are whistles. And they stand at street corners and they can blow their whistles and scream at people all day long. But once people realize they don't have authority to enforce anything, they'll just run through stop signs, go through red lights, go over the speed limit. They'll just look at the police officers and laugh because they can't enforce anything. But if police officers have a car and a siren and a black book, then we all sit up and take notice because they can't enforce the law. Fathers, we can't hide and hope that things will go well in our family. It won't work so well. We have to lead and take action. Finally, quit blaming. Verse 11, God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Instead of taking it like a man and confessing his sin, Adam plays the blame game. First thing he says when God says, if you take him from the tree, the woman. He blames the woman. And then he says, the woman you put here with me. He even blames God. I see dads in our church, dads that aren't part of this church, who've decided they're not going to blame their dads. Maybe they didn't have a good dad experience, but they're not going to spend, waste their energy blaming their dad. They're all about forgiving their dad and charting a new path. What if you had a dad who was never around, was always too busy, never affirming, didn't show affection, and he drank way too much? You know, all dads pass a legacy on to their children. Some get a baton from their dad that's good. Some get a, a, a baton that's damaged. You say, I don't want to pass a bad baton on to my children. I want to turn a new way. I know a dad who was out with his buddies. They all ordered beers, but he ordered water. The other guys looked at him and said, what's with you? Are you on a diet? He said, no, my dad drank way too much and it ruined our family. And I decided when we had kids that I wasn't going to drink. I know another dad who has taught his children debt-free living. He says, never put on credit a uh, purchase for a, a depreciating asset like a car, jewelry, furniture, appliances, a vacation. Other guys say to him, well, was your dad a CPA or CFO? And he says, no, my dad's overspending nearly destroyed us. And I decided I'm going to take my kids a new direction. I'm going to teach them to always spend less than they earn and to take that money and save it and let it build and so they earn compound interest. Still another dad had a father who pushed him so hard in sports, he ended up hating it. So he decided that he would cultivate his children's interest in whatever direction they went. And so he put aside his sports gear and helped his son build a rocket in the backyard because his child was into science and tech. I know another man whose dad never went to church. He didn't teach them about faith or God. This kid got to high school and he went to a camp like Chris is talking about. And he gave his life to Christ. And he read in the Bible, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. He realized it wouldn't do him any good to blame his dad. But he wasn't going to blow it in the same way. He realized it was his responsibility to teach his children about Christ. I see dads in our church who are 
showing their kids about Christ and discipling them at home and they're bringing them to our kids space and our youth program. And I'm so proud of you. You've decided you want to pass a good baton onto your kids. One of the dads in our church I'm proud of is Matt Nichols. Come on up here, Matt. I met Matt a year ago at our community Bible camp. And uh, Matt has a wife, Rachel, and a daughter, uh, Brooklyn, who's going into eighth grade, a son, Matt, going into sixth grade, seventh grade, and Ashlyn's going into first grade. So um, I've been impressed just meeting you this year. It seems like you're doing a great job as a father. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're learning, uh, what maybe you've done well or not so well? First of all. He's, you're good. I'm a very, very, very lucky guy for them, uh, for that to be my family right there. I'm, I'm blessed each and every day. Where are you in that photo? Behind the camera. Okay. That's, you know, That's what dads do. Filling the dad role. <laughs> uh, so May 12th, 2005, I uh, officially became a father. Um, my life had a new purpose. And 13 years later and two additional kids, I'm still trying to fulfill that purpose. Um, now, I'm not up here to pass out a how-to instruction manual on how to be a good dad. Not that it would do dads any good since we don't read instruction manuals. <laughs> uh, when I was asked you know, to share, I thought, oh, this, this will be a, a piece of cake. And I began to think about it. And I don't really know if I am a successful dad. I still have three kids who are unemployed and still living at home. <laughs> But there have been some, some, some good moments, um, what I consider good moments, some dad genius. We had a door slamming issue in our house. Uh, someone would get upset, I won't mention their name, um, go to their room, slam the door. It wasn't just the slamming, it was then the conversation that was attempted behind the closed door. So I had enough and um, I removed the door. The door slamming stopped. <laughs> uh, eventually, the door was earned back. You know, occasionally, there's still a door that's closed a little too loudly, but it's now immediately followed by, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to slam it that hard. Pretty smart. That's a good move. So I'm feeling, feeling pretty good about that. Now, I've done a pretty good job of making sure that my failures were not documented. Um, I didn't want those coming back to be used against me, against me but my kids did a, a pretty good job of finding out, finding some times where, uh, where I did fail and got some pictures to share with you about that. You were in charge? Yeah. <laughs> Rachel left them in with you? Yeah. <laughs> They fall on their heads a lot. They do. They do. There, there we go. Not, not my best moments. Um, but I realized, I've looked at those pictures probably a hundred times, and when dads aren't doing well, it's the kids who, who end up suffering just kind of occurred to me through, through everything. Um, now, as I reflected back, and I, I, you know, I've had some, some great dad moments, um, standing in line with Ashlyn at Disneyland, not for the rides, but to get autographs. Well, Rachel and the older kids got to go on all the roller coasters. Um, dancing the night away with my daughters at the father-daughter dance at their school, although my daughters may consider that a failure right there. Um, but I haven't always done a, done a great job of, of being a leader in my house. I haven't always been the pastor of my family. Um, there have been times, situations where, you know, anger can, can take over and my mini Chuck Norris comes out and there's some, there's some walls that have felt, uh, you know, the brunt of my anger and a dresser that I tried to use as a ladder and went all the way through and 
at different different moments like that. Not that I'm that I'm proud of those moments, um, but there's three things that I'm I'm really focusing on um, that I'm trying to to make a priority. Um, number one is to to love God. Um, if I love God, I'm pursuing Him. Um, I'm reading. I'm coming to church. I'm being an example of a godly man for, for my kids. Number two is to, to love my wife. Um, if I love my wife, I cherish her. I protect her. My daughters see how a husband is supposed to treat their wife, so now their standards are higher um, for when that unlucky boy comes knocking on my door. Um, and my son sees how he should treat his wife, how he should treat his children. Um, and the third thing is, is to love my kids, uh, and that means sacrificing. Um, that means they know that they are a priority, they know they are important, they know they have value, um, they are comforted, in, and they are safe. Um, and so how do I do these things? I'm in the Word daily. Um, I come to church. Um, I read my Bible where my kids can see their dad reading, reading the Bible. I read out of a real Bible so there isn't confusion whether dad's playing words with friends or, or, if, he, he's, or if he's reading. Um, I come to church so I can, I can worship, so I can be inspired. I go to a small group so that I can be encouraged and to encourage. Um, I go to the men's morning watch Saturday mornings so I can be sharpened and gain wisdom. Guys, there's a lot of wisdom in that room. And, and, and some of the guys in there are more than willing to share. Um, I know that I can't be um, the dad that I'm supposed to be without help. I have an accountability partner, so I have to be honest. I have a mentor because I don't have all the answers. I can't be the dad uh, without, without their help and, the, and their support. Thanks, man. Well, I was going to take this right. and shake this. All right. <clears throat> Let's give him a hand. So my challenge today to all fathers, all men, is quit sitting, quit hiding, and quit blaming. I, see, I hear some dad here today who says, you know, this was an off year for me dad-wise. I'm not proud of it. Well, it's never too late. You're just a prayer away. You say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I believe you're the son of God and I want to commit my life to you. You see, being a healthy dad is not about just trying harder. It isn't about setting better goals. It's about admitting our weaknesses and depending on God's power moment by moment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Matt and many other dads, men that uh, I see them doing a great job, not blaming their dads, not sitting around hiding, but taking action. And I pray for every man here today, I pray for every dad, that you would encourage them, help them uh, to get their strength from you and uh, their wisdom from you and do a great job. Um, I want to give you a moment to, to pray right now. Uh, if you've never given your life to Christ, you say, you know, I've heard enough. I believe you're the Son of God and I want you in my life. I need your power in my life. I commit my life to you. You can just do that right now in a prayer. Uh, you're here today as a man, as a father, and you want to commit to not hiding and uh, sitting and blaming. You can say that to God right now. Like all of you, just to... Just to talk to God for a minute. You pray. Father, thank you that you are a good father. You're so uh, great and you set the example for us. Uh, and uh, we just thank you for bringing us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.